The Richmond Spiders need to be on your radar. Aaron Roussel, who builds winners everywhere he goes, is here to talk to me about it. Locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked on Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. Over 175,000 of you showed up in January alone to listen to our showing up for you six days a week. And, of course, it is not just me. It is the incredible team over at The Next where we cover women's basketball 24-7, over 100 reported pieces every month. We have Natalie Heverin an incredible dedicated reporter on the Atlantic 10. We cover it all. Subscribe $9 a month, $72 a year, thenexthoops.com. Help us continue to do this vital work. And we have done this work in such a way that today's guest has frequently been part of our coverage, both during your Bucknell days, Coach, and now here at Richmond, where you are once again building a team. At the time of this recording, you guys are 20 and 4. It's fascinating. It's not surprising. Coach, welcome to the program. I just want to kind of get your sense, before we get into the trajectory of your career in segment one, Here, year five here at Richmond. Is this where you thought you guys would be? Um you know, you, I say thought you, it always sounds like really smart to say, hey, we knew we were going to be here the whole time, right? Um, you know, obviously being at a couple different rebuilds, you, you think you're doing things right. There, there, there's things here that mirrored how it started at Bucknell and and, and even way back at, at University of Chicago. But, you know, there's there, there's some leap of faith that happen during this too, you know, and there's always going to be moments, even this year, I know the record looks great, but there's a couple of times you're like, whoa, do we just not have it? Is this not it? Is it, is it not in the cards? And, you know, some of those things happen in year one that makes you, I don't say second guess, but, you know, year two and year three is like, wait, wait, do, are we, not that we're not doing this right, but, you know, can we still get to that point? And, you know, so I, I don't know what our ceiling is. I, I still think we can get better. Um, the, the, the record's great, but, um, you have to be happy with where we are, um, and maybe I'll just leave it at that. I have to be happy with where we are. I, I do. I, I did believe that we could get to this point without question. You know, I, I love the players that we have. I love the pieces and how it all meshes together. Um, but you know, there's some close games that could have gone either way, and so you do have to have that leap of faith. But uh, very, very proud of of what's happened with this program over the last five years. And, and rightly so. And again, when I say that this is the pattern that follows. Listeners at home need to understand, uh, Coach, you, you're at University of Chicago at a place, I think it's fair to say, was not a women's basketball hotbed prior to your arrival in 2004. It's, it, it's hard to recruit to a place where they, um, you know, very comfortably and very proudly uh, tagline in the university is where fun comes to die. That, that's not always the, the leading thing. You know, when you're walking kids on campus and, you know, University of Chicago shirts where, where fun comes to die, we actually flipped that, you know, and again, I was 24, 25 when I got hired. And, you know, we, we all of our University of Chicago women's basketball stuff was nobody has more fun. You know, we, we tried to really make that a, a thing there. And, um, but a, a, an incredible place, man. Like I tell people, you know, when I first started there in 2004, like I parked in front of Obama's house going to work every day. Nobody knew who he was, you know, like I knew Michelle Obama. I, I didn't know, you know, nobody knew who all of that other stuff was. And so that was um, a really, really cool place at, at that time. Um, had, had inherited great kids and um, you, you look back at it now very, very fondly, but it was a really, really cool time uh, to, to be in Chicago at that point too. You ended up turning it into a place where you were in the NCAA tournament, essentially annually going to the Sweet 16, going to the Elite Eight. Uh, again, and we've talked about this on the program, D3 is no joke and people need to understand that. 
Uh, but you have replicated this model again, you know, go to a place that is also no slouch when it comes to academics at Bucknell and doing it in the Patriot League. And uh, I am proud that we have a dedicated Patriot League reporter over at the next in Todd Niklowski. Yeah. And we have the ability to cover what you did there and your teams at Chicago, at Bucknell. You defend first and you are consistently in the upper 20 percent, usually upper 10 percent in terms of defensive rating, defensive points per possession. There is a consistency to it. But, you know, some of those seasons you put up in Bucknell are almost incredible when you think about the numbers that you guys were putting up. Your record at Bucknell over the last four seasons you were there, 102 and 30. Again, not the easiest thing to recruit in the Patriot League. You know, John Feinstein had that famous book about the Patriot called The Last Amateurs. You know, did you feel like Chicago helped inform you at Bucknell? Well, no question. You know, and obviously you start at uh, at, at Chicago, um, you know, again, 24, 25. You're thankful the Internet was still there. I, you know, you get the job like I think two weeks before practice started like that was a whirlwind. Right. And, and so that was you're really learning as you go. Um, you know, I remember you know, at 44, you try to seem younger and cool now. I was 24, 25. I was trying to look older. You know, like no official came over and was like, where's your head coach? Like, where, yeah. where, where is he at? So <laughs> you know, I had, a, had another young assistant with me. And, you know, we're the youngest. You know, I was the youngest head coach in division in, in, in all of NCAA at that point. So it was that was a baptism by fire. Um, small and short story. You know, you talked about Todd covering us at, at, at the Patriot League. He was in the league at University of Chicago. He was at Brandeis. So I was coaching against him. And so we we kind of had that thing going there. We realized how great uh, of a level that level of Division Three basketball was. Mm -hmm. um, just like now, like I'm not scheduling Division Three, you know, preseason games. I, I, I'm too smart for that. I, I know that high level of of Division Three. But, um, you know, I think obviously that experience, both from a recruiting standpoint, but also from, from the game of basketball, right? You know, so you get the Bucknell job. There's a little bit of confidence. At least you try to rely on that confidence of, hey, this worked at at Chicago, similar academic model, playing a similar way. Um, probably have to remind our kids, I appreciate you talking about our defense. You know, we really were built on defense back in the day, man. Like that really, really was young. We're going to be tougher. We're going to really, really defend. I'd like to think that we still do that and, and maybe recently a little bit better. But, I, you know, I think I hate to say we're more of an offensive team because that, that, that would be a, a slight to our defense. But, you know, I, I think the game is adapted too. you know, so some of that, a lot of the things that we were doing offensively and even defensively in 2004, 2005, crazy to think that it wouldn't adapt to now. But, you know, I tell people now the offense we were running at, at, at Bucknell in 17 and 19 were like incredible. Like if you look at those numbers, are incredible. I don't know that not because of it up the level, it's just the game has changed a little bit. And, and so it, it's a little bit more open, a little bit more free flowing. I think we've maybe look a little bit more like what, you know, European professional leagues, maybe the WNBA to a certain extent, the NBA, it, 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 the game has changed, which I think has changed our defense um, a little bit, but I'll, I'll have to remind our current players, you know, that, that people are still talking about our defense back in the day too. We, we got to get to that. It, it's true. And, and again, you are obviously adaptable because you talk about that offense and you guys are a top 30 offensive team this year. You know, you come in at 105.2 points per possession. I mean, that is 30th in the country. So you are not coming by your success this year on one side of the ball as opposed to the other. Uh, but I, I do think it's so interesting when you talk about the ways in which you had to kind of build a tradition at University of Chicago and in some ways at Bucknell as well. Um, and then coming into, you know, to rebuild at Richmond, you're a product of University of Iowa, which is obviously a fundamentally different thing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, Iowa's been in the news a little bit lately. Are, they, women's basketball program still pretty good there? They're doing all right? Okay, good. Yeah, good they, have, they have managed to find a way to win a couple of games. Right. And so I guess I wonder how much being part of that legacy, being uh, at a place where Dr. Christine Grant was so important, you know, where Vivian Stringer built, you know, did that help set your course for being part of women's basketball for life? Um, you know, I, I wish I were smart enough at that age to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, you know, Coach Bluter came in, I think, my junior year at, uh, at Iowa. 
And I think the first time I met Lisa Bluter was maybe 2008, you know, when I was, you know, three or four years into in the time at Chicago, if even then, you know, know her well now. Um, she's been fantastic. What they are doing is like one of my favorite stories out there. You know, honestly, Howard, man, I, I went to undergrad always loving basketball, would have loved to make a career. Out of it. I never thought I could do this. Like, I never thought of this being a career. I, I went to University of Iowa thinking I was going to law school the entire time, you know? And so it wasn't until after I left Iowa that, that these opportunities started to happen. You know, um, you know, Jenny Lillis, you know, at, um, at, at Oklahoma, uh, now I guess I'm using her, her, her maiden name now, um, yeah. Eric and Swagger, like those guys were like killing it at Iowa. And I'm sitting here like now at this age, like, man, you dummy, like <laughs> at Lisa Bluter there, you could have found a way to be into this and, and maybe carved a, a, a different path. I just never thought of like being into this. I was so focused on the LSAT and everything else. And yeah. you know, meanwhile, they're winning a big 10 championship. They're doing all these great things. You missed out on an incredible resource, incredible opportunity. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously seeing what they're doing now is incredible. I, I'm proud to, to say I'm an Iowa alum. I just, again, we're all 18 or 22 and just had, had different passions at that point um, and just probably didn't take advantage of it, to, if I were being honest. I, I am a contemporary of yours. I often think about what I missed out on during that period of time as well. But the good news is that you were also a, a double major, not just in poli sci, but in journalism. So you avoided uh, my dying industry. In the so congratulations wow. on that. Uh, I, I want to talk more about that, more about your path. And specifically, we got to talk Spiders basketball too, because man, you guys have an interesting team uh, within the context of what my belief is the most underrated conference in America. So back in just a minute, it was segment two. Uh, but first, Locked on Women's Basketball is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's the biggest, it's the easiest, it's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy. Look, it's just you against the numbers. You pick between two and six player stat projections. It's up to you. You're not facing any sort of sharks. It's just more, less, and if you pick right, you win. Now there's something called demon time on prize pitch, which is amazing. So check out the little squares marked with red demons or green goblins. If you select them and you win, you can win up to a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks. So go to prizepitch.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Again, that is prizepitch.com slash L O C K E D O N N B A. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Lock. Back with Richmond Spiders head coach Aaron Roussel. And again, you think about okay, the path's not taken, the path's taken. You make this decision to come to Richmond April of 2019. What a perfect, stable time here uh, in America and in basketball as well. Very little changed, I know, over the subsequent right. year or two after you did it. Uh, I, I just, I, I flagged it because I think people need to understand that, yeah, you followed the same path of success here at Richmond that you have everywhere you've gone, but it had to have been indescribably harder, not just because you're taking that jump to the A-10, but doing it amid COVID. How much has your plan had to change and adapt from that alone? Well, I mean, you know, you, you talk, we talked earlier about adapting, you know, whether your industry, our industry. I mean, a, a lot of that was COVID. Somewhat tied with COVID was the transfer portal. I mean, I know that, you know, maybe one didn't lead to the other, but those things are tied right now, right? The extra year of eligibility. Um, how different schools handled uh, COVID, you know, all, all of those sort of things. So I think one thing really, really proud of, um, and it's hard at the time, but we, we've always kind of tried to play this long game, you know, and that, that's been a big thing with me of like, I wanted sustained, su sustained success. We talked about balancing classes when we got here. This wasn't a quick fix. We didn't run anybody off. You know, we inherited a large roster. I think we had six, seven freshmen, I think even when we got here that year. 
you know, in 2023, it's only what, four years, five years, 24, I guess now, right. um, you know, four or five years later, but like, that's unheard of now. Like, it's just everybody leaves, you know, um, you know, whether they're being run off or choose to leave. And, and we were really proud of like, these are our kids, you know, we, we are not moving out and bringing in quote, our kids, one of my biggest pet peeves in, uh, in coaching right now, like they're yours, man, like they're ours. And, and so we did that at all of the places. I think we, we got better. We, we developed players that we had, but those kids were also great kids and they helped recruit too. So like, it was a stable atmosphere. Like, I think we had a good relationship with our players. I mean, I know this gets really, really hard, especially this day and age to have great relationships one through 15, but I, I think we had a good thing going here. And I think the culture was like, Hey, this is a great place. These, these are good people who actually care about you. Um, and so I think that's always been kind of the, the building blocks uh, for all of this stuff. Um, but yeah, man, COVID, COVID threw a little bit of a wrench in there, you know, like a little bit with recruiting, um, a little bit with just throwing the model out there. Um, but I, I, I think water's kind of found its level a little bit. Things have settled uh, mm -hmm. as much as things can settle in the NCAA women's basketball in 2024. That is fair. And again, we're at a point now where the wondering whether a player is coming for a fifth year or not, we're almost at the end of that, which I know that that alone had to be complicated as you're trying to figure out your all. It, it still it still is, man. And, and again, we haven't talked about this, uh, meaning, you know, we and our, our, our players, but like, you know, we, we have six kids, you know, if you want to call it that, that like have that will graduate or that will it can go well elsewhere that and maybe I shouldn't share this with everybody trying to recruit uh, Richmond right now, but like those kids are going to have opportunities, you know? And, and so there's a little bit of like, you know, we don't know where this is going to go and, and probably the same as other 350 coaches out there. You don't know what's going to happen in March and April. And so that's where maybe some things have changed where we talked about building for the long game, the sustained model, I just don't know how much that happens anymore. You know, Coach Mooney on the men's side for us has been incredible. And he was like steadfast, you know, four-year kids, develop all of these things. They're having an incredible year right now. Six of their top eight kids are, are transfers, you know? And, and so that's maybe things change when we get out of the COVID thing. Um, you know, probably not the topic to talk about now, but gets to employees, gets to whatever that relationship is between players and school and what binds them to the school I think probably changes in the next two to four years. Um, and so yeah. maybe it stabilizes a little bit. Maybe I just say the word punitive, but you know, maybe there's a little bit more that ties kids to a school. But in the meantime, right now, there's there's no longer like I used to have a four and five year plan on the marker board with with roster. Right. I still have that man, but like we know that's gonna be in, in flux. Um, it's true. I mean, listen, uh, that that Dartmouth decision alone is going to potentially have huge uh, ramifications for the entire model. It's fascinating to see. I will just say, you, you know, you're and you're absolutely right. And there are different ways of players being able to do it. But your top six minute getters have only played at Richmond. Top six, correct. And and correct. I, I I guess I wonder from that perspective, how much do you tie those two things together? A top six that has played in the system and only played in the system with a 20 and four record that you're holding right now. I, I don't think, I don't think we could overstate uh, the impact of that, you know, and you look at how we play right now, you're watching film from yesterday, uh, from, from last night, this morning. And, you know, like we have good freshmen, like we have some good freshmen right now. We have some good sophomores right now, but like, it just takes time, you know, and coach Mooney talked about this too. Like it's, you kind of have to change your system, adapt a little bit. If we didn't have as many experienced kids as we as we have right now, we couldn't do some of the things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that just happens organically in a game, you know, sometimes sometimes makes us look really smart. Yo, man, these are just kids that have been taught, they've developed, they've worked hard, um, both individually and three on three and five on four. Sometimes we're just playing. That's where it gets hard for some of these freshmen, man. It's like you are good, you can do these things, but like there's a learning curve. There, there's a there, there, there's some learned and some experienced things that have to happen uh, for that. And I know that we can probably play a different way. I, I know that we are the only team in the conference that's, that, that isn't starting a transfer um, right now. You know, you mentioned it, our top six minutes kids. And I, we've got a couple grad transfers that have been key for us. I don't want to make it seem like we're anti-transfer portal. Um, but yeah, man, the, the stability, um, the, the getting to know each other and, and play off of each other is something that I'm very grateful for, um, knowing that it's not always going to happen, but I think very grateful for right now. 
you also are incredibly effective year after year at hunting the best shots. And uh, if you'll forgive me for getting a little nerdy here, there's a stat I love. Uh, if you go over to CBB Analytics, uh, field goal percentage shots by region. Outside of the paint, twos. You guys are taking 4.5% of your shots from that area of the court. It's like, I think it's Utah and then you guys. Yeah. It's right there at the very top. Even that number, you know, it, your teams are, are good at it the last few years. It's taken a quantum leap forward. Take me through how that happens and how how you, it, it seems deliberate, obviously, but like, how do you get your players to that spot? Well, well, first off, you do not ever have to apologize for nerding out with uh, with, with me, with basketball and stats, man. Like, I was not always like this, but um, probably drives my staff nuts a little bit. But, like, I can't get enough of this stuff, right? I, whether it, different levels of basketball, you know, it's a major part of our preparation um, when it comes to scouting others, um, when we're evaluating ourselves. You know, the four and a half percent, I can probably say is maybe double or triple what it was two years ago. One of my favorite stats ever was we entered conference play, I think, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you could look at this as being good or bad, but we had played 13 games and we were one for 13 from outside the lane tubes. And I was like, that's the greatest stat. I, I could do you know, <laughs> that. Um, it wasn't a great percentage, but like we'd only taken, you know, one per game. We, mm -hmm. We've softened that. I, I think you kind of have to adapt a little bit. Um, you know, we have kids in different situations where we're hunting. I say we're probably not hunting the twos, uh, but obviously late games, man. Like you just need to make the basket, you know, so it's maybe a little bit different than we have some very skilled kids, whether it's off ball screens, catch and shoot in that area. Maybe some of those kids were were trying to prove me wrong that, hey, man, like we got to we got to shoot some more mid ranges. So they've worked at it and we've established um you know, different ways that we can score uh, at, at those points. So I think you have to, you know, people figure this out a little bit. So I am proud that we've adapted uh, and maybe made it a little bit more a part of our game. Um, but it, it is deliberate. You know, I think we, you look at our two point shooting percentage, you look at our effective field goal percentage that that does stick, that that's very telltale of success, both in a game for a season. Uh, it is something that we we measure very much so when it comes to our offense and our defense. The two the two are not unrelated, to put it mildly. And yeah, no, even you finished for the year. I just went back to check that year, uh, two years ago, at seventeen percent. So even by that measure, overall, you guys have reached another level with it, which is fascinating, um, and of course, dramatically effective. So well, and, and it's something you know. You know, very proud of this. If you want to say this, but just yeah. kind of all the adaptation, adaptation in, in the in the um, development of our players. Like that was, we were top ten, you know, top five, top ten our last few years at, at Bucknell, uh, especially that last year, uh, effective field goal percentage. You know, we we got here, and all of a sudden we looked at we were top ten, and then the, the the team coming back from Richmond, we were like eighth from the last. You know, I think we were number eight in the country and number eight from the bottom uh, when we got here when we inherited that team, and you know, three years later we were you know in that top group again, when it came to shooting percentages, um, taking good shots, all, all of that sort of stuff. And, and we've been able to kind of stay in that in that top tier uh, here for a while. So it is very deliberate. I mean, it's something we recruit to. It's something that we develop uh, and work at and just kind of everybody thinks about the game differently, uh, different strengths. But it is something that we definitely you know measure everything on. And the success is undeniable. Figuring out where we go from there for the success, something we're going to talk about in segment three right after this. Lockdown Women's Basketball is brought to you by BetterHelp. And this show is brought to you by BetterHelp specifically. Now, look, sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. It is important to let that out, especially to someone who is unbiased in your life. So I'm going to tell you how I really feel about something. You might even be feeling the same way this week. The fights, the battles between different fandom within women's basketball, people sitting here thinking there can only be one, that we cannot celebrate multiple players, multiple programs. It's 20th century thinking. It's pitting women against women. I'm so exhausted by it. I don't get involved with it online. I'm urging all of you not to, but it's just what wasted energy when we can be lifting 
all of the stories instead. And so, look, therapy gives you the opportunity to do this if you don't have a podcast, right? Most of us have bigger problems than figuring out which fan base is most in the right. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. So back with Richmond coach Aaron Roussel, and I do want to talk about something related to it, which is it's got to be easier to get your players to buy in on not taking long twos when they're so effective from beyond the arc. You guys are eighth in the country in three-point field goal percentage, up near 38% coming into the, the weekend's games. And so when you look at what you guys are able to accomplish offensively, I know you've said you're concerned about uh, the some of the defense lately, uh, although I, I will say that seems more process uh, rather than, uh, let us say, results, because I go back and look and I see that you guys have held just in the past three weeks teams to 54, 39, 61, 60, and 49. Uh, and yes, 72 in the one loss along those times, but it seems to be working pretty well in terms of outcome do you see another level for this team even beyond? I know it's a weird thing to ask you, 20 and 4, 10 and 1 in conference, but what is that next level like? Well, you know, I, I, I thought we played very well last night uh, against Rhode Island, you know, but you're watching film today and you're like, oh, you know, like there's a certain percentage of, of, of shots, certain percentage of, of offensive possessions where I just, yeah, like, guys, that's not us. Like, they, they, we need to do this one better, need to do this better. And, you know, we, we probably had dipped a little bit. I know our offensive numbers are still still up there, but I thought we really had dipped maybe the last couple of weeks. And, hmm. you know, trying to identify all of that, whether it's player movement, ball movement, uh, you know, you get to this time of year, Howard, you know this, man. Sometimes it's just getting away from it. Sometimes it's an extra off day. You know, hmm. it's a lighter practice. It's we all want to prepare. We all want to over prepare. We all grew up, you know, and got to this point probably because more is more, right? The harder you work, the better things go. And sometimes you just got to kind of scale back a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned it, the, the long twos. I mean, it, you know, I, I don't probably freak out about it as much as, as the last couple of years, because, again, we, we've had some success and, and, and we're not going to not hunt or not not we're not going to pass those up. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're going to kind of target. And how do, how do we get our best shooters, the best shots where, where they're most effective? And some of that's play design. But a lot of that is just I hate to say the word culture, but some of that is just our kids believe in each other, man. Like our, our kids, you know, like Maggie Dugan, the the two most excited I've ever seen her probably this year, she threw a three quarter length pass to a uh, teammate in, in stride. Probably the entire bench behind me is like, oh my God, what are you doing? And it like right in her hands, boom, Dayton calls a timeout. It was like perfect. She got so excited for that. Last night, third possession of the game, she sets an unbelievable screen on huge kid from Rhode Island and, and Addie Budnick hits a three and it's like, Boom. Like, you know, it, there's no like three point celebration from our kids. They're getting excited about screens. They're getting excited about moving the basketball. Like it's just fans that we've, you know, didn't have uh, a few years ago or coming to watch our games just being like, they just love pretty basketball, you know, and we've been able to move the ball and, um, you know, it, it's a credit to our players that they've really bought into that. We above me. And, you know, definitely a lot of sacrifices when, when you're playing as many skilled players as we have right now. Um, they're, they're all buying in. You need those players who are trusting in how you get there, not just uh, how you, you know, what the end result is. And it's evident in the way you guys play. It's also, and, and again, this is more philosophical, but it's fascinating to me that you guys have obviously made a couple of conscious choices. Like you are not crashing the offensive glass. It's just <laughs> not a thing that you're doing and you are not taking chances trying to force those steals. What you're doing instead is essentially saying, we're going to rim protect. We're going to force you to make to be as difficult as possible to get to the rim and finish. And people are not finishing, whether it's the fact that you're top 10 in the country in block rate or the fact that people are simply not efficient finishing at the rim against you guys, even when they get those shots up. Is that a question of your personnel here? Or is that something just uh, theoretically that you think is best practice? Yeah, a, a little bit of both, right? And it kind of goes back to measuring things with field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage. Like, you know, you don't want to give up good shots. You know, Eddie Budnick, they're, they're, I don't remember anybody in basketball. I don't care the level that, that can 
one of the best shooters in the country and also be in the top whatever in the country in block shots. Like three-point shooting and block shots, like that's just not happening anywhere. And um, so a little bit of like when, when you say the, the the players and the personnel, that that's a big part of it. Um, you know, just try not to give up. Uh, we're trying to get easy shots and try not to give up easy shots. Like, I don't know. I don't mean to oversimplify basketball, but like, there we go. Now, the flip side of that, as far as you mentioned rebounding, like I used to be all about rebounding and still am. Like I think rebounding is very much a telltale sign of of how a game goes, how your season goes. When you say you're not making an attempt to to go to the offensive boards or make that a big part of our, I think maybe some of the language and some of the talks in, in our practices, our players would like, uh, you don't think he cares about offensive rebound? It's probably the thing he talks about the most um, that, that we're just really struggling with. So I, I do think we got to get better at that. But the flip side is – Yo, man, if we're not getting to the offensive glass, we can't get beat in transition. You, you can't have it both ways, right? Like you, you have to be a really, really good defensive transition team if you're not getting offensive rebounds. So probably, you know, going back to your question, or how do you get better? How do we kind of raise the bar a little bit to be a great offensive team? And, I, and, and it's always our goal to kind of be, you know, we say number one, but you know, always to be kind of in that top tier offensive efficiency team in the country. Mm-hmm. We can get a few more chances at it, you know, offensive rebounds. That would be great. It's not always how we're measuring things. If we can get a few more steals, force a few more turnovers, maybe we can get some easy ones in transition. All of those things are tied together. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to get easy baskets. Don't give up easy baskets. There you go. I, I mean, it really is your own fault on the offensive glass because you guys are north of 55% effective field goal percentage. So if you were not making as many shots, you could create more opportunities. I guess that's probably not something you want to work on in practice. Well, you know, you talk about hey, your, your, your kids, you want your kids to have confidence in each other, right? So it's like, hey, guys, I love the fact that we think they're all going in. Like, <laughs> when we're really, really good. Like we're really good. 50, 60% of these shots are not going to go in from three. So like, let's get a few more, but I, I will say to our kids credit, man, we we've gotten some big ones and big moments, you know, Rhode Island's probably one of the best you know, defensive rebounding teams in the country. You know, we had some huge ones last night and even the last time that we played them. So it, it's, it hasn't been non-existent, um, but I think it is something that we can, we can get better at. And I think our players uh, have heard that a, a fair amount too. Well, it's fascinating for me to see the direction you guys are going. I am interested what you think, the ceiling is not just for this year, but in this program in general, you know, and, and just I, I need our listeners to understand this very briefly. I know we're we're running short on time, but the Atlantic 10 has so many good teams. Uh, you guys are currently tops in net rating. You're at 52, but you have George Mason and St. Joe's north of 60, VCU and Davidson north of 80 as well. Rhode Island, uh, you know, some losses have dropped the net rating overall, but that is a really good team. That team beat Princeton early. They were like season. overwhelming. I mean, they might have been unanimous, you know, preseason, all, all kind yeah. of preseason pick in, in the league. Like they are incredibly, incredibly good. It's just so is the rest of the league. It's it's just it's just a criminally underrated league. And so when you think about sort of where this could be, I, I'm sure you have your set sight on the NCAA tournament this year, but what should Richmond year in and year out be in your view? Where are you trying to build to? Yeah, I mean, I think the same as, as Chicago and the same as, as, as being at Bucknell. Mm-hmm. Like it, you get the you get yourself to a point in the program where the goal is to win the conference every year. Right. Um, you know, Chicago, there was eight teams in the league. Bucknell, there's 10. So like there, there's it was still difficult. But like you're talking about 15 schools that care about basketball that care about women's basketball. So like we are a basketball centric league and there's 15 of us. And most years, you know, you're, you're struggling to get a second team in the team in in the tournament, you're struggling to get in that large. And so that makes it very, very difficult. Um, But it also like everybody realizes that the bar has been raised and we were a good conference a few years ago. We've had some very good coaches some very good teams, but you know, when I got here, there was also kind of a, a cycle of, of, of new coaches during that time, too. You mentioned Davidson Gale, like she's doing an incredible job, you know, at, at a tough school. And, you know, so that was a little bit of a rebuild. You look at George Mason right now, like that's, you know, she's doing an incredible job right now. So there was a you know, mountain. So there was a lot of newer coaches and, you know, also the cycles of like Cindy at, at St. Joe's, like they were 
they've been in, you know, one of the best, you know, programs in, in our conference, you know, they were doing this and, and now back up again. And, you know, you mentioned Rhode Island. So like, I just think there's a lot of schools that are really, really going after this, you know, UMass was at the top of the league and all of a sudden now they're, they're maybe struggling a little bit uh, at the bottom part of that's the nature of NCAA basketball right now, but it's just, you got 15 really good coaches. You got 15 ADs that care about this, a commissioner that cares about this. Like this is a basketball centric league. And I, I think it's in a really, really, it's cool when you look at this and you're a hey, pro a 10. That's great. It is a little hard when you're in the league being like, yo, man, what else do we got to do? Like, you know, all of us, St. Joe's is 21 and two, 22 and two. They've lost to us. They've lost to Utah. And that's it. And like, there's no separation. Like all mm -hmm. of us right now are 72 hours away from being a one seed. And then, oh, by the way, you have bad two games in 72 hours. You're not the sixth seed. Like mm -hmm. that changes everything. Um, and so, there's a lot of great leagues out there. Um, you know, I, I know we're not the only ones, but it's it's very, very competitive at the top. And you saw some of the wins that our league has had and some of the competitive games that we've had with the top conferences. Um, it's a great time for the A-10, and, and I have to think it's, it's going to continue to be on the rise the next few years. No doubt in my mind. And, Coach, you're going to be, I am equally certain, part of that rise. Wonderful to see it. And uh, great to catch up with you. Thank you for your time to our listeners. Thank you for making us a part of your uh, part of your routine every single day. We will be back with you tomorrow and, of course, six days a week. Until then, I am Howard Megdahl, wishing all of you a wonderful day. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. 